now. Okay. Uh, so um, I'd like to remind you that at the end of the webinar, we will have a Q&A session. So if you have any questions, please write them in the chat. Okay, so we will read them at the end of the webinar. And please also make reference to whom you want to um, uh, reply to your questions. Okay, so if it's Alexia or Carmen. Uh, but now, um, I give the floor to our founder, Ecomarine uh, founder, Patricia Patti, marine biologist and dolphin enthusiast. <laughs> she can tell us something about Ecomarine missions and the purpose of this webinar. Thank you, Francesca. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here with us uh, this evening uh, for this uh, one hour chat about the Posidonia Oceanica. Uh, so, uh, Ecomarine Malta is uh, a social enterprise that works in the sector of the ecotourism, marine ecotourism. Um, the three pillars of the Ecomarine Malta are uh, environmental education, scientific research, and uh, uh, sustainable tourism. Uh, the idea, our idea is to merge uh, the science with the um, um, public awareness. Uh, so um, in this moment, we are running a project, a scientific research project about the bottlenose dolphin here in the Maltese waters. And uh, the I'm, uh, I'm of uh, this webinar and the other webinars of so the all the series uh, is uh, to share our knowledge, but especially our passion about uh, this incredible environment. It is a marine ecosystem, what we can do to preserve it. And obviously, uh, as much as we know about it, as much we can do to protect it. Uh, I'm very, very pleased uh, to have here this evening uh, two uh, friends uh, like uh, Alexia and uh, Carmen uh, that will help uh, us uh, to better understand uh, this incredible and fantastic and amazing uh, and uh, beautiful uh, environment that is the Posidonia. Uh, enjoy your webinar and uh, feel free to ask uh, any question to, at the end of, uh, of the webinar. Thank you. Okay, so can you hear us? Because we got a message that uh, you can't hear it. Okay, okay, thank you. So maybe, uh, yeah, Ina, maybe check your settings. Okay, so could you could you hear the introduction? Okay. Okay, so I can hear. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. So um, I will um, give you an introduction of our experts now. So Dr. Carmen Mifsud has been working on marine issues for more, more than 20 years. She is a marine biologist and currently a member of the IUCN Marine Turtle Specialist Group and fellow of the Royal Society of Biology. Currently also part of pool of experts. Okay, I can hear you also. So we have <laughs> some issues with, with the set, maybe, but I think it's a matter of your oh, setting. Yes. Yeah, so check your settings, guys. Okay, so I was, talking about um, Carmen. So she is part of the pool of experts co-authoring the World Ocean Assessment Second under the United Nations. She led and managed various European and regional projects and designated a number of MPAs in Malta. She is Syrian and Syrian Senior Environment Protection Officer with Environmental Research Authority here in Malta. She was speaking her own capacity, so she is not representing the era now. Dr. Alexia Massagalucci is a fisheries biologist with extensive experience in applied research, fieldwork, data analysis, and writing in both marine biology and fishery science. She obtained a PhD in fisheries biology in Ireland at the University College of Dublin for research on the management and conservation of wild fish populations. She pursued the postdoc research project 
in a variety of subjects from conservation biology through environmental sustainability to impact of climate change and ocean acidification on marine habitats. She is currently working as senior scientific consultant, consultant at HACO Biotech Group in Malta, where she leads the fisheries research and development department. So today it's going to be all women very passionate about the ocean and the sea, and especially about the Posidonia. So let's start with Carmen. So I'll give you um, the possibility to share your presentation now. Okay. okay, okay. Is it visible? Okay. And you are hearing me. Everybody's hearing me? Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, I, I won't be able to see any any chat, so we can have them um, we can have them at the end, any any kind of questions. I'd be talking about the Posidonia Meadows. Thank you for, for the introduction to both of you, and thanks for giving me this opportunity. Um, I will be giving the presentation about characteristics and the role of Posidonia uh, in our seas. As a summary, I'm going to give a bit of basic information about the biodiversity and the most important species in terms of the food chains, the zoning in the marine environment, so we can understand where, uh, um, where is what, okay, and the process towards um, marine protected areas locally in terms of designations for the Posidonia, okay? Now, um, we usually are faced with this dilemma. I mean, we know that dolphins are very important, turtles are very important, um, the endemic uh, monacus monacus, the endemic seal that we have in the Mediterranean, commercial species like, like the red coral or commercial species like the grouper. I mean, all these are patrimonial species or flagship species. And we're usually faced with the dilemma, what is important? I mean, they are usually put in lists and very important lists in national conventions. However, something important that we usually miss is that in these important lists, we also have vegetation. And why is vegetation important? Because we sometimes overlook vegetation. I mean, we know that the sun provides energy and there's nutrients in the sea, which are providing um, nutrients to the, to the sea grasses and to the algae. These are in turn are eaten by herbivores, these are in turn eaten by carnivores, then they are eaten by top predators, okay? And then they go all into the composition or whatever, and, and they recycle the nutrients there, okay? So um, in terms of very, very crudely, if some of the patrimonial species are not there, although this is very complicated, much more than this, the food waves are extremely complicated, part of the cycle can still continue. However, as you can see, no part of the cycle can continue if vegetation is not there, okay? So that's why vegetation is very important to also be included in, in, these, in these lists of conventions, okay? Um, now, in terms of vegetation, this is usually divided into those which are algae, okay? And those which are plants. Plants which have returned back to the sea, okay? In terms of algae, usually we have the basic, basic subdivision into red algae, brown algae, and green algae. And these are different from sea grasses because they are usually have, they usually have only a hold fast, okay, by which to attach to the substratum. In fact, some of them are, are very weird. For example, this one here looks like a rock. It, it is a type of red alga, okay? Um, but they don't have roots, unlike plants, okay? And they don't produce flowers. Now, in terms of the zoning of, the, of, of our coast, we usually divide it into what is called the supralittoral zone, the zone where we consider as the splash zone, which is only reached by splashes of, 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 of sea, sea, sea spray, okay? Which is a very, very tough environment because it's, it's um, exposed to, to humidity, exposed to a lot of salinity, or if there's a lot of rainwater ex exposed to a lot of fresh water. And in fact, here, you do have some kind of algae. Usually these kind of algae are microscopic, however. 
Then there's the medial lateral zone. The medial lateral zone is that zone which gets covered and uncovered, covered and uncovered because of waves. And here you have thriving algae. For example, you have some species of Laurentia, and you can usually see these algae, okay? These are not any more microscopic now, okay? Further down, just underneath the supralittoral, you find what is called the infralittoral. Don't get a headache because of these names, but infralittoral is basically that zone which is never exposed, okay? So it's all the time covered by seawater. And here you will have a lot of and a lot of algae. But here is where you can start having also the seagrasses, okay? The kind of flowering plants, plants that we'll go into a bit more detail into. And this zone actually goes up to the zone where seagrasses can survive a maximum of 45 to 50 meters, okay? Because basically that's up to where penetration of the sunlight can be enough for the, for the plant to survive, okay? So, so basically it's up to about 50 meters. Now, with regards to soft bottoms of the infralitoral, uh, sandy bottoms or, or muddy bottoms, you usually have what is called the Posidonia oceanica, which we'll go into a bit more detail into when the conditions are stable. And um, sometimes this is mixed with, with other kinds of seagrasses like Chemodocia or Zestera or other, other type of seagrasses. In fact, in the whole world, we have something like 58 species of seagrasses out of which five are present in the Mediterranean. And one of them, the Posidonia oceanica, okay, which is a flowering plant. In fact, you can see the flower here, okay, or here, what, what is called inflorescence, is actually a plant, okay? It's a flowering plant. Being a flowering plant, um, it also produces a fruit. In fact, here you can see the fruit. The fruit looks exactly like an olive. Okay, in fact, it, it also turns a little bit blackish when, it, when it's a bit old. Okay, so, so the fresh ones would be greener and the older ones would be a bit blackish. Um, and this, interestingly enough, this, this kind of seagrass is endemic to the Mediterranean. The, the next um, um, family member, which is close to it, is a, a kind of seagrass found in Australia. Okay, these are in fact the fruits, okay which very much look like very much olives, okay? And this is the Posidonia with tufts of leaves, which can grow up to one meter or 1.5 meter. The inflorescence, okay, the flower. However, it does not flower all the time. Usually it flowers when there's a bit of stress, okay? And what is very important is that it has roots. And in fact, it has roots, both growing horizontally and also vertically. And this uh, issue of having vertical roots is because it can grow uh, higher and higher in the mat. Okay, we'll see what, what the mat is, okay? Okay, so that's when we go diving or snorkeling, we see the canopy, this is the parts we see, okay? And this is the part underneath, which is made up of the rhizome, which is the type of roots of, of, of the seagrass system, which, which is intermingled with the actual sediment. And when it um, kind of suffocates itself, it grows higher and higher because of this kind of vertical root system that it has. Okay, it's very it's very important for the whole for the whole uh, ecosystem because we will see later on. Alex, we will develop this much much longer. There's a lot of interests where a lot of animals can actually thrive. It it has a lot of algae and a, a lot of other things. And very interestingly, is that the Mediterranean makes up only 0.8% from the whole oceans. However, we have 9% of all the species of the world, and most of them, 70% of that, is from zero to 50 meters, which are in these Posidonia meadows. So they are like the Amazon forest. They are so important for, for everything, for all the life in the oceans, okay? In our sea, actually. Um, as we said, it grows between zero to 45 meters. It covers only 3% um, of, of the ocean because it can only thrive up to a maximum of 45 meters. And um, the actual mat can be as old as 100,000 years old, okay? What is very important is that like all, uh, all other plants, it produces a lot of oxygen and one square meter can produce up to 20 liters of oxygen. It can absorb up to 48 liters of carbon dioxide. 
So it is very crucial for carbon sequestration, helping to combat climate change. Um, as we said, this then also for, forms other important habitats for, for other animals, and it fixes also the sediment and prevents further coastal erosion. Is it threatened? Yes, it is. It is endemic to the Mediterranean. It is very threatened. About 34% of the population has been lost in the last 50 years, and the rate of decline is several hundred times faster than the, grow, the rate of growth. Um, and an interesting thing is that um, in 1992, the EU developed what is called the Habitus Directive, okay, which is a directive uh, based on the conservation of natural habitats of white flora and fauna, known as the Habitus Directive in short. And basically, one of the measures that one of the measures, apart from protecting species and habitats of EU interest, is that the member states, which are part of this group of the EU, this regional group, have to propose sites for inclusion in a network of protected areas, which is called Natura 2000. Okay. And basically, there's a number of articles whereby you have procedures, criteria, and timeframes for underlying how to do this process of the Natura 2000. Obviously, the member states have to conserve them, have to take steps that they are not deteriorated. They have to assess all the projects and activities which can impact these Natura 2000. They have to go through a special kind of process. And in priority habitats, because the Posidonia is considered according to the EU as a priority habitat, the only considerations which can be taken into consideration are those relating to human health and public safety. Now, uh, in fact, Part of this um, type of habitats that need to be protected as Natura 2000. There are also sand banks, as well as mudflats and coastal lagoons. But Posidonia and coastal lagoons, which we actually don't have as part of the definition, but we do have Posidonia beds and they are priority habitat. That's why they have an asterisk. We have to protect them as, as these kind of protected areas, Natura 2000, part of the Natura 2000 network. Um, to date, we have about five sites in Malta, which are protected for Posidonia. There was a study done in 2000 by GAS. Okay, it was commissioned by, at the time, the Environment Protection Department and the Planning Authority. And since Malta is inclined like this, so the northeast side is very shallow, it can go a bit, a bit more far out. So there's more Posidonia far out. And basically, it was decided that we, we will do one whole um, Marine protected area here, another one here, 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 and another one here. So basically it's five, five areas which were done uh, as marine protected areas as part of the Natura 2000 network for Posidonia. And in fact, in 2010-12, the EU congratulated our uh, the Maltese um, and endeavor to, to, to protect this Posidonia because we basically protected, I think, more than 95% of our Posidonia. And she said that the, despite our small size, we have protected a lot in terms of, of marine protected areas. Okay. So basically that's it. Um, thank you for listening. I will, I will now um, uh, invite uh, Alexia and we can have some, some at the end. We can have some more questions at the end. Uh, now I have to... Okay. Uh, stop share. Okay. So, Alexia, you can take over. Thank you, Carmen. And Francesca, I think that you need to pass me the rights for uh, sharing. Uh, thank you, Carmen. And uh, also, I wanted to thank um, Ecomarine Malta for inviting me here tonight. Uh, as uh, Francesca was introducing me, I've been uh, um, an enthusiast basically all my life working in uh, for the sea, for the environment, uh, in different capacities as a fisheries and marine biologist, and also had the pleasure to work with Ecomarine Malta uh, since uh, its inception. So we have been uh, sharing a lot, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, I'm taking and building up on uh, what uh, was discussed during uh, Carmen's presentation. So uh, if we look at uh, the Mediterranean Sea 
of biodiversity. I just have to um, change one set here so that I move the bar below, down below, and I can see my own presentation. So um, if we have a look at the Mediterranean Sea uh, and also look at what's usually shared in uh, the media and also looking back at what Carmen um, just told us, you, one big and important element is uh, the biodiversity. We very often uh, hear about problems related to the environment, saying that there is a problem with a lack of biodiversity or loss of biodiversity and so on and so forth. But actually what is really biodiversity means and what really we have to look um, for and to try to, uh, to maintain and protect? Well, biodiversity in um, very simple terms is uh, basically all the variability and the variety of organisms in terms of animal and plants related to one specific habitat, in this case, the marine environment. Now, uh, the, uh, the of my presentation is, I think, so the Mediterranean Sea, as Carmen just uh, said before, uh, occupies less than 1% of the global ocean surface. And is a very small sea, it's an enclosed sea where, and that's where we uh, actually live and find ourselves. But despite that, 12% um, of the global marine biodiversity is contained in this small sea. And 30% of all the species present inside the Mediterranean Sea are endemic. So this means that these species um, are only and exclusively present and exist in the Mediterranean. Once these species are lost due to um, impact, uh, various anthropo anthropogenic impact, like for example, pollution or other type of disturbances, they are lost forever. And Posidonia is actually one of these species. Also, if we consider the Mediterranean Sea like any a big body of water, uh, in an ocean or a sea, there are various different types of habitat that are included in uh, this um, environment. So among the many habitats present in the Mediterranean Sea, one of the most uh, that presents the, and supports the highest biodiversity is actually um, the, uh, the sea grass Posidonia. And all these elements together uh, brought to the designation of the Mediterranean Sea as a hotspot of biodiversity and actually is uh, officially considered one of those. And for this very reason, there are lots of programs of conservation and funds that every year are given in order to um, keep up and to maintain the unique diversity of species of animal plants present in this sea. As I was just saying to second uh, let's say that the, the Posidonia Oceanica meadows are one of the habitats that supports the most biodiversity. More than 1,000 species have been identified and associated with the Posidonia Oceanica meadows. And as you can remember from the previous presentation, the Posidonia Oceanica as a seagrass occupies what is called the infralittoral zone. The infralittoral zone is the part of the Mediterranean um, or the habitat in the Mediterranean uh, where uh, that is always immersed and is never exposed. And that's actually suitable for life of a, a completely marine plant like Posidonia uh, oceanica. Now, if we look uh, at the uh, important role that Posidonia oceanica as a seagrass is having within uh, the Mediterranean, we can explain that if we look briefly at uh, its structure. As um, anticipated by Carmen, uh, we have, Posidonia is actually a proper plant. And as such, it has roots that are anchoring the plant to the substratum. The substratum uh, could be either um, sand or rocks and so on and so forth. And then there is one part that uh, is um, tougher, that is actually the rhizome, from which then the leaves are actually coming out. Now it could be either uh, oriented uh, vertically or horizontally, and all the rhizomes and uh, the roots and the leaves of every single um, shoot of Posidonia together are gathering a lot of sediment and this creates a structure that is called mud. You can see in this diagram briefly um, how it is stru uh, structuring and how it's actually um, modifying the bottom of the sea. And let's say that the main um, uh, roles, the main functions that Posidonia is having within uh, the environment are related to providing support shelter and food to a variety of both plants and animals uh, in, inside the marine, uh, the marine environment. 
regarding support, in fact, um, if uh, it happened to you to see some uh, leaves of Posidonia oceanica floating around uh, in a day or uh, maybe on the surface of the water, and you take one of these leaves and then you run your fingers through it, you will notice that the leaf itself is not smooth. And sometimes has a very, um, a very distinctive coloration, kind of whitish coloration. The reason is because the leaf itself, as well as the rhizome, um, hosts a, a big variety of both plants and animal organisms. These organisms are called these, uh, these organisms are called epiphytes because they live on uh, the plant itself. And um, the uh, the Posidonia in this way uh, provides a lot of physical support, or better say, substratum where these animals can, and plants can anchor and live. Uh, some examples are represented by hydrozoa or bryozoa. These animals are uh, very, very small, and hence the, uh, the pictures here that I present you are some of them, especially for electroposidonia and the other bryozoa, are a um, magnification of uh, some samples that have been collected. Whereas um, we have some even smaller organisms that can be, again, it can be observed on, 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 uh, on, on the, under a microscope, but then we have a lot of macroinvertebrates that also colonize both the leaves and the roots of, uh, sorry, of the rhizomes of the Posidonia. For example, uh, Posidonia can also provide in these ways food because there are animals that can feed directly on uh, the epiphytes uh, that are living on the leaves, like for example, the urchin or Paracentrotus lividus or the starfish, Asterina pancheri, or that are actually eating animals that are um, nearby the meadows inside the leaves and between the leaves basically and uh, the substratum, like for example, this little nodibranch that is um, a small mollusk, or even this little crustacean that, as you can see, is even completely green. And unless you have a very good eye for it, it would be very difficult to spot because in this way, it's protecting itself from being um, eaten. Uh, we have fish that, have been, uh, that basically evolved and are completely herbivorous and feed themselves mostly on Posidonia leaves, like, for example, uh, the fish Salema salpa salpa. Again, if it uh, happens that you can that you find some leaves of Posidonia, you might find also that some of these leaves have small damages in the shape of uh, half moon. These actually are bite of the fish um, uh, salpa salpa that eats uh, with his mouth little piece of the leaf. And, and one uh, very important um, uh, species that is feeding and is almost completely herbivore is the green turtle, Kelonia midas. And another very important uh, function um, uh, having that the Posidonia oceanica meadows have is uh, providing shelter. Shelter for both adult uh, animals, but also for uh, shelter for the eggs that some of these animals lays in between uh, the structure of the Posidonia. Regarding the adult animals that we can find, there are lots of macroinvertebrates, like for example, the echinoderms, like the sea urchins or the starfish, or other invertebrates like sponges that can colonize different parts of the mat of Posidonia, like sometimes you can see them partly growing around the rhizomes and developing so on. And in between uh, the leaves and the rhizomes and the substratum, you, if you are lucky, you might spot an octopus or sometimes um, uh, a cuttlefish. And so, and so let's say that also leaves of the Posidonia provide shelter and refuge for these little, very colorful little fish. Actually, there are some of my favorites, like the pink and combe and some of the most colorful brass that you can find in the med, like the rainbow or the ornite brass, or also some of the, of the brims that are even part of the fish that are commercially important and sometimes end up on our plate. Also, the, um, the area surrounding a Posidonia meadow is actually a very productive area, and we can find um, very distinctive and characteristic organisms, um, like, for example, the noble um, pen shell. Unfortunately, this species is highly threatened due to a mass mortality event, and all in few areas in the Mediterranean, there are still some of these uh, big, uh, very big noble pen shell. And uh, also this species has been threatened by anthropogenic impact because it was fished, even though it's protected. And hopefully 
um, for the few areas where this species is still present, hopefully from these areas, it will be possible recolonization of the rest of the Mediterranean. Uh, uh, joining all these elements together, let's say what Carmen was telling you before regarding um, how important and how structured uh, is a food web and how important a vegetation it is for a food web, as well as what I basically outline here in terms of biodiversity. Let's say that joining all these elements together and all these parts, and um, it, it makes it easier to visualize how complex could be the food web associated with the Posidonia meadows themselves, and how important the Posidonia meadows can act, uh, is for um, providing food and providing support to a lot of species that then are going to be part of food for other species in higher trophic levels. So from, let's say, what we've been seeing in terms of, um, um, oops, sorry, my bad. Uh, so basically for what we've been seeing in terms of the interaction at the level of the meadow itself at the bottom of the sea, uh, the species, the small species of fish will be eaten by bigger fish and so on, supporting higher trophic level of the food web. And ultimately these bigger fish up to, for example, big tunas or swordfish are the commercial fish species that are targeted by uh, fishery, uh, the fisheries industry. And hence these are the fish species that are going to end up on our plate. So it is very, very important to uh, protect the integrity of the Posidonia meadows. And as Carmen was outlining before, that's why um, marine protected area are actually laid around in order to protect such an important type of habitat. And um, in fact, let's say that uh, Posidonia meadows in terms of marine threats um, are mostly, uh, unfortunately, threatened by anthropogenic activity. In fact, one of the main uh, conditions for having a healthy Posidonia meadows is the water transparency. And uh, uh, in areas that are highly uh, developed around the coastline, like for example, Malta, as well as most, in reality, most of the Mediterranean, uh, the population is actually distributing itself, the human population is distributing itself around the coastline. There is a lot of coastal development in the form of urbanization, pollution and sedimentation. All these aspects are actually um, um, impacting negatively on the quality of the seawater, on the column of water, increasing the sedimentation of in the column of water and decreasing the transparency. And this actually is one of the main reasons why sometimes Posidonia meadows tend to disappear or do not grow at its maximum potential. One of the other main uh, contributor to the decrease of the water transparency is, for example, the presence of aquaculture structures, also aquaculture farms that are actually input, inputting a lot of nutrients and sediments into the water column. And this creates phenomenon of eutrophication due to the fact that uh, too much nutrients create a lot of algal blooms. And this, again, diminishes the um, transparency of the water column. And then again, one of the main factors for the, um, uh, the having not very healthy Posidonia meadows is anchoring, either due to small boats, like boats or uh, big uh, anchoring, uh, big boats like, for example, cruise ships and so on. And one of the main culprits also for having the disappearance of the Posidonia meadows are the fisheries practices related to trolling. So all these elements, as you can see, basically are related to human activities. So what we can do in order to prevent that, what we can contribute as on a daily basis in order to um, prevent that or at least diminish that. First of all, it is the um, uh, up, up taking uh, more sustainable living practices in a way that we can try to reduce at um, domestic level uh, the amount of pollution that we contribute into the environment. And for example, we could adopt the use of uh, less impacting uh, detergents or other products for cleaning and, uh, and so on, trying to avoid to um, for example, another, another thing that can be used in terms of aquaculture, what we can do as consumers is try to choose uh, products that comes from sustainable aquaculture practices. And for that, as consumers, we have the power to uh, buy 
products that are certified as such. And these will for sure guarantee uh, a less uh, impact on the environment and hence on the Posidonia as well. So um, in case we are going out on a boat or we are actually uh, going out for a leisure cruise, just try to remember to the captain or whoever is there that is important not to anchor on the Posidonia Oceanica. The main reason, as Carmen was saying before, is that the disappearance of Posidonia Oceanica has been quite fast due to all these elements that outline here. But the issue is that Posidonia Oceanica grow very slow. Being a, a, a plant, is could be more than a proper meadow, actually form forests, forests that are perennial, and they take one century to grow, to regrow as one square meters of Posidonia. So the impact that sometimes is uh, given to the to one meadow is actually very, very big and we do not realize that. So it's very, very important that we try to implement whatever we can in whichever way we can, little actions that can contribute to save the, uh, the Posidonia. Posidonia and thanks for your attention. Are we allowed to um, ask questions? Hello. Yes. Hello. Yes. 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 Just, yes. You uh, can you can type your questions in the chat. Which I did. Okay. Okay. Perfect. So um, I don't know if Patrizia wants to add something before the Q and A session. I know, I just want, uh, first of all, thank you very much, Alexia and uh, Carmen, for this uh, amazing presentation. Uh, you give us uh, a lot of uh, insights about uh, Mediterranean biodiversity, Posidonia, etc. Uh, just maybe something that uh, we can also add is uh, the importance of um, uh, the dead Posidonia the banquet of dead Posidonia on the beach and uh, the role of the Posidonia uh, as uh, um, plans to protect uh, the coast from the erosion. Maybe if you can tell us something about this, uh, it would be interesting for, uh, for me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm yes, of course. Um, regarding um, one of the other uh, important roles played by Posidonia oh, is Isha. actually when the leaves are um, falling out, uh, falling off, actually, better say, from the stem that they connect on top of the rhizome. So, um, unfortunately, I cannot speak and show you again the presentation. But anyway, if you remember, basically, the leaf is inserted directly into the rhizome. The leaf falls off during autumn like for any basically um, terrestrial plant, uh, you would have um, a senescence of the leaf itself. And then during autumn, um, there is the loss of the leaf itself. The difference between a live leaf and a dead one is very, very striking because the, the live leaf is completely green, whereas the dead one, it becomes brown. And then uh, due to, due to the uh, weather changes uh, in autumn, and then, uh, for example, a few storms, some of the leaves come to the shore and then accumulates on uh, um, the beach on the coastline. And this creates another structure called banquette. Most of actually the terminology associated with Posidonia is in French because the, the first group of researchers that was um, the, basically describing all the processes uh, of Posidonia were actually French. And so the banquette really looks like a footpath. If left undisturbed, a banquette will look exactly like a footpath of Posidonia leaves, and these will uh, work together, creating a structure that traps sediment. So um, it's going to have a very important role on a terrestrial level for a lot of other organisms, uh, animals especially, that live among those dead leaves. And um, it can create also a barrier uh, against erosion, for the erosion of the beaches, because um, it can stop the action of the wave when it comes onto shore. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank very you so good. much. So I'm going to read the first questions from Moira. Hi, Alexia. It's very fascinating knowing that such a beautiful meadow sustains so much life. Is the Posidonia, in fact, edible, please? As far as I know, Posidonia is not edible. Posidonia contains a lot of um, fibers. In fact, if you take one of the leaf in your hands, 
dead or alive is actually very fiber rich. There are a lot of other um, uh, applications that can be done, uh, or let's say usage that can be done traditionally of Posidonia leaves. For example, the one that, uh, that we were just describing on the banquet, the one that are dead and on, uh, on shore, uh, this can be taken and used, for example, as fertilizer. In the past, they've been used um, as for uh, filling of mattresses, or uh, lately there are new ways to explore how to use these leaves because they contain a very uh, little, uh, small amount of oxygen and high level of silicate. So it's a perfect, for example, material for uh, building Building, and especially put them in between walls because they are also flame retardant, naturally flame retardant. There are again traditional and new way where this material can be used, but not for unfortunately not for a salad. Okay, thank you. Uh, then we have a question from Martina. Alexia mentioned several threats to this species. Following the designation of the five areas as MPAs, what activities have been managed at these sites and what enforcement is in place? I'm aware that new aquaculture guidelines and practices have been put in place in recent years, 2017, but what about enforcement of leisure boat anchoring tanks? So this is- this Maybe Carmen. I think maybe, this. yes. Carmen? Yes, um, I wanted to, to add a small point also with regards to the importance of the Posidonia banquets. Um, in the past, um, they used to make some kind of straw hats or something. So even, even in the past, they used to do uh, kind of hats from the Posidonia leaves. And they used to also use it as fodder for animals. Okay, so, so um, they used to uh, wash it because it has a lot of salts, obviously, but they used to, to, to do it underneath animals so that animals, um, they put it in stables and animals. So they, 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 there were a lot of uses kind of with regards to Posidonia banquets. Obviously the importance is to leave them a bit there so that the, the, the actual sand won't go away with regards to the, to the waves, et cetera, et cetera. And in fact, now there are guidelines so that in winter, the Posidonia banquets are not removed, okay? Because they, they also have an important ecosystem there. In fact, um, you, you can even now probably see some, some kind of fishermen go there and uh, they take out some kind of crustaceans which are found in the Posidonia banquets to actually, um, to actually fish with these kind of crustaceans because there's a whole kind of habitat um, in these and these Posidonia banquets, and they are very important to leave them there. Otherwise, we will lose our, our sandy beaches um, much more often and much more frequent. And in fact, cleaning is usually done in, in the midst of summer, okay? Uh, with regards to these marine protected areas that we have, there's a whole system of, of how this works. In fact, um, after some time, one has to um, do conservation measures for these for this size, and the actual member states have a number of, of um, have a number of years years how to do a management plan. In fact, I think it was up for consultation. Era has 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 issued um, some conservation plans, some some management plans for these areas. They are still under discussions with with stakeholders how to actually go about the the actual management of each and every site. However, in terms of Natura 2000, once they are Natura 2000 site, and they have been Natura 2000 site for, for some time now, all the activities and all the projects which are done near a Natura 2000 or in a Natura 2000 have to go through a process. It's called appropriate assessment process or procedure. There's a particular process whereby the Environment Resource Authority assesses these projects, these projects and assesses the kind of impact that is done. And in fact, for example, certain um, project owners are asked to submit what is called an appropriate assessment report, which is like an EIA, like an Environment Impact Assessment, but it is more specific to habitats and species, okay? It is, only with regards to habitat and species and what will be the impacts and 
no, no impacts or whatever of these kind of projects and, and, and activities. So there is an actual system until, uh, until the management plans are done and even afterwards, okay, because the system will still continue. For example, if there's a coastal project nearby um, for an application of, um, with the planning authority to create some kind of structure nearby, um, obviously, it will have to go through this process, okay, which is an automatic process, and and the era will will give its views about about such projects, obviously. So it is being taken care of. Um, with regards to anchoring, um, abroad there there are they usually have these kind of special anchors where there is Posidonia, so that they won't damage the actual Posidonia. Um, we are still in, in, in discussion, kind of. I mean, air is still in discussion and with, with transport, uh, Malta, etc. So it's still in the process. Um, but obviously, um, there are systems where, where you can do certain types of anchors, uh, special kind of anchors or, or special kind of moorings, which do not damage the Posidonia. So they exist, actually. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you so much. So we have um, another question from Esther. Thank you for interesting presentation. Is there any more extensive data about, for example, density, patchiness, depth of Posidonia in the, in the Maltese Island? Uh, does it that exist and could possibly be accessed? So I think this is again a question for Carmen. Actually, there's a lot of, of papers um, which, were, which were done on Posidonia. There's a lot of papers about the studies of Posidonia. And I believe um, even with regards to the uh, marine vegetation and marine seagrasses symposia, which were held over the years, there were a lot of submissions of papers with regards to um, densities and, and also um, analysis with regards to what kind of Posidonia we have, because there are different kind of structures with different kind of nomenclatures. So yes, they do exist. Um, offhand, from what I remember, is one of the healthiest meadows that we have is between Malta and Gozo and uh, Gozo and 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 Comino. I mean, that part um, of the channel, the, the Fligo. Uh, in fact, I think one of the highest records that we have is like 44 meters, but I believe Cyprus, they also have possibly going down to 46 meters or 47. So it's one of the highest depths that we have for with regards to Posidonia. Um, uh, what was the question again? Um, Yes, there, there, there's a lot of studies done. Um, I don't know if through the planning authority server, when we used, we, when it was part of MEPA, the environment was with the planning authority, there was probably a lot of data from the baseline surveys. I don't know if you can access some kind of data from there, um, but if this person requires particular kind of papers, um, the, Ms. Zakova, I mean, we, we can send her some, some kind of papers or something with regards to density, for example. There were whole theses done, for example, on White Tower Bay. I remember it was Shirley McAuliffe, I think, 1997, probably, who did a thesis on the density um, of Posidonia in, in White Tower Bay and even in, um, in other areas. So there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of information because even um, most of the projects that are done now, which are near to Posidonia, um, ERA also obliges the, the contractor to do some studies because obviously we want to monitor um, how the Posidonia is doing and if the project would be affecting uh, this kind of meadows. So there would also be information from EIAs. So if this person can access actually some particular EIAs near Posidonia, um, which are usually available from ERA website. She can also access uh, data with regards to, to density density and patchiness and depth, et cetera, of, of the Posidonia, because 
these are the kind of information required with regards to monitoring of the Posidonia. Um, was there any other question or did I answer? I think you answered. Thank okay. you so much. Um, so uh, next question we have, we still have a um, couple of questions. So um, what about the role of Posidonia in the absorption of atmospheric CO2 blue carbon? So yeah, I think this is for Alexia. So Posidonia is uh, one of the seagrasses uh, that creates one of the one of the main five seagrasses environments around the world is actually, I think, the third one in terms of capacity absorption of CO2. So is um, a very good carbon sink that helps combat as um, also Carmen was saying the climate change because helps absorbing CO2 and uh, allows basically to the production of oxygen. And these obviously produce, in, creates what's called productivity within the marine environment. As in producing O2 and absorbing CO2 allows also to basically oxygenate the sea. And not only the sea, because the sea and the atmosphere are not two different or separated compartments. They are intercommunicating. And the oxygen that we breathe is actually the oxygen that is produced by Posidonia, especially in an island like Malta, where there are not that many trees, probably most of the oxygen that we are breathing right now comes from, uh, from Posidonia. Related to the carbon sink, again, is the third most efficient um, seagrass type of habitat in terms of absorption of carbon. The first one, if I remember correctly, in terms of numbers is mangroves, but we don't have mangroves here, so. Thank you. Uh, I will, um, there is another question still from Esther. Um, yeah, uh, we still have uh, 10 minutes. <laughs> we have, yeah. So first, um, Isabel, so sorry. Uh, if fishing is still allowed within the marine protected areas, is Posidonia being protected from techniques like trolling? <laughs> Yeah, um, I don't know, Carmen, if you want to answer that one, but oh, as far as I know, trolling zones are not overlapping into the exactly. areas yeah, uh, of the areas of the marine protected areas and for sure not close by Posidonia, unless if for illegal trolling. Yes, exactly. Not. The legal trolling grounds are, are far off from, from yes. the Posidonia meadows. Yes. Okay. Uh, from Hannah. Are there any correlations with Posidonia cover and shark array abundance? Mm. In this case, what we can say that there are no direct correlation or study about it, but because Posidonia supports such a viable amount of fish and that's, that's actually been measured and there are many papers about it, the abundance of fish, so in terms of biomass, but also species diversity, probably some of the species may be praise of shark and rays, and hence, yes, the more the better. The, but I, I haven't seen any paper in a direct correlation between uh, Posidonia abundance and shark ray presence, but for sure, what I can tell you, there are many, many papers, many, many studies about a healthy Posidonia meadow and high level of abundance um, uh, in species. Well, sorry, in fish. Okay, thank you. Uh, from Maria, uh, what you call this kind of anchors and moorings, is it possible to name a few or show us an example or describe it? Well, it, it's, it's the ones I was referring to are, are kind of particular moorings called ecological moorings. And basically you tie, you tie your, your, your line with these kind of ecological moorings. And these actually are like spring-like and go um, in the Posidonia without actually damaging the Posidonia. So you don't have to um, take off and, and go on. You just latch onto, onto these kind of moorings. We don't yet have them in Malta. Um, we had the intention of doing some pilot projects, but we need more time to do these. Um, but uh, I mean, they exist also also in, in, un, in other countries and, and we need to, to try to maybe in the future, whatever, develop these things. Okay, thank you. 
Um, Esther, another question from Esther. I have one more question. Since there is a serious lack of forests in Malta and Posidonia meadows are very important when it comes to carbon sequestration, has any formula been proposed to numerically calculate the rate of sea sequestration by the seagrass species, just as it's been developed for various three species? Yes, yes, there are studies that actually have um, calculated the amount of, of, of CO2 that a seagrass can actually absorb, as well that what I was referring before in terms of is the third most efficient species of seagrass that is able to do that because there are um, rankings and also has been able to calculate how much oxygen uh, seagrasses, not only Posidonia in the Mediterranean, but seagrasses overall are contributing to the production of oxygen together with algae, but also with um, terrestrial plants. And it seems that actually the sea is one of the most um, abundant production product, producing in terms of uh, production in terms of oxygen. So most of our oxygen uh, comes from the sea. Okay, thank you. I think this was uh, the last question. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, everyone, for participating, to be here. Thank you to Alexia and to uh, Carmen to be our uh, um, ambassador of the Seagrass uh, Award this month. It was uh, a pleasure. <laughs> yes, yeah, my pleasure, definitely. I really, really enjoyed it. It's always very important to uh, spread knowledge about uh, this uh, incredible ecosystem that sometimes uh, is uh, very underestimated. And uh, we know that it is uh, the lungs of our sea and so we have to protect it uh, as much as we can. So thank you for uh, your, uh, your comments, for your question that uh, were very interesting. And uh, again, thank you uh, to everyone. I hope to see you again for the next webinar. We will talk about uh, the uh, megafauna. Uh, so we will talk about turtles and dolphins here in Malta. We will go, uh, uh, we will focus more in the Maltese uh, environment. So Maltese dolphins and Maltese turtles, but uh, yes, we will talk also about the Mediterranean species. So see you next time. Thank you very much, uh, thank everyone. Thank you to Francesca. <laughs> to thank you to Patricia. Uh, <laughs> yeah, to yeah. host the, the meeting and the webinar. Yeah. Okay. So we uh, people are asking if we are going to uh, send the recordings. The recording will be available on YouTube. Uh, we will send the we will send you the link on the um, uh, on the participation event. Uh, feel free to send us an email uh, in, at info at uh, ecomarinemalta.com.mt if you have any questions. Exactly. Um, yeah, and I think there was another another question. Uh, when it will be the next uh, webinar? We don't know yet, so stay posted. Okay. <laughs> We're waiting for our uh, turtle expert uh, yeah. <laughs> to give us the, the okay for the date. Exactly. And, uh, yeah, so. And will the panelists panelists will uh, would the panelists be willing to share their email address? Yeah, yeah, you can send us an email so uh, we can give you their emails. Okay. Okay. Thank so, you so much. Have a good you. night. Thank you. See thank you, you everybody. Have a good night. Thank you. Good night. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. You were great. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Hey, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs>